somebody said that the ultimate accolade for a brand is that they become the generic for that particular category. And I think, uh, in a sense, Google uh, stands for that. So if you think search, you think Google. And we've seen that happen, whether it's IBM, it's Kodak, it's Xerox. I mean, you know, these are brands that have then gone on to define their category. As you look at the world today, uh, in the context of the fact that you're seeing disruption on a daily basis, uh, the idea of category and the idea of brand, uh, how are you now linking the two and how are you thinking about it for the future? Yeah, look, I think, uh, you know, in, in, in our space, um, what is different, when I say in our space in technology, right, I think what is different today from, let's say, 20 years ago is you have the ability to build a very large user base. Mm before you start monetizing, right? I think if you think about traditional approach of building brands, right, you acquire customers and generally you'd like every customer to be break even. Yeah. From day zero or day one, right? Uh, the idea of you would go five, seven, ten years without generating any levels of profit, mm. actually in some cases without generating any revenue, yeah. was unimaginable, you know, even 10 or 15 years mm. ago. But I think what's changed today is there are 3.5 billion internet users. Mm. India, there are 400 mm. billion of them. And so glo if you're building a global internet product, let's say in a new category, right? Mm. Let's say new, new category emerges. Mm. If you're able to go out and acquire, let's say 100 or 200 or 300 million right. users, let's say Snapchat being the most recent, right. when you do decide to monetize, Snapchat's a great example, right? Mm. Because they're focusing on the US digital market, which is actually pretty large and established now, once I switch on monetization, mm. I can go from zero to a billion revenue like that, right? Mm. So I think, I think the, it's, it's really a, a paradigm shift mm. of how you build brands, right? So, so when I look at like all this uh, you know, fuss about Indian startups mm. losing money, mm. um, actually the greatest internet companies had, did not make money in the yeah. first several years. Actually they had no revenue, right? Yeah. Uh, Facebook. Snapchat, mm. Twitter, Google, right? And, and, and I think that's pretty important. And so, so, you know, my view is at least in our space, the way you build a brand yeah. is have, I think I completely agree with Priya, you have to build products mm. that meet real users' needs. They have to have an amazing experience in, in our space because you're yeah. one click away from the competition, right? Yeah. But then you have to actually go out and get a large number of users mm even if it means you're actually going to invest for a very long period of time, hmm. right? Because but, that's the, but that's where the fuss is, right, as far as Indian startups are concerned, because the runway of being able to have enough capital in the bank uh, funding you, uh, even before you see any visibility as far as profitability is concerned, which is what is causing anguish and grief no, today in the yeah, Indian startup no, I completely agree, but yeah. I actually think this, all this anguish and angst hmm. is not really required. So I'll give you, a, let's, let's just look at the global technology yeah. landscape, okay? 2005, 12 years ago, one out of the 10 most valuable companies in the US was a technology company, mm. it was Microsoft. They were mm. valued at 250 billion, right? Valuation. Today, if you look at last week, five out of the top 10 companies were technology companies. Yeah. 2.7 trillion of market cap, $94 billion worth of operating profit, mm. actually net profit, mm and $100 billion of cash, mm. over $100 billion, right? $500 billion actually. Mm. So, so, you know, these companies over a period of time, they become incredibly profitable, right? But, but to look at, you know, in many ways, you know, the India's internet ecosystem is all of five years old. Yeah. It's almost like saying, look, Netscape was 1995. Mm. It's almost like looking at the U.S. in the year 2000 and saying, oh mm. my God, mm. we are losing so much money. Mm. Google was just invented like a yeah. year ago. Yeah. Facebook hasn't been invented. Yeah. WhatsApp hasn't been yeah. invented. Snapchat's about a decade away. Yeah. And all you really had was Amazon had gone public, mm. Yahoo was public. Mm. And so, so actually look at, I actually think looking at India's mm. startup ecosystem in 2017 mm. is akin to looking at the U.S. internet. By the way, there were 300 million internet users in the U.S. Mm. Globally, actually, in, yeah. in the year 2000, there were only 300 million yeah. internet users. Today, yeah. there are 3.5 billion. Yeah. So I actually think, I think I, I actually don't see a big fuss. And by the way, I actually think that we've gone through a period of 15 months or so where oh. capital has been hard. Right. But that's really not the case anymore.
Okay, capital may not necessarily be as hard to get anymore, and perhaps there has also been uh, introspection on getting the execution right, as well as reimagining the business model as well. So I think a little bit of that that process is uh, underway. Richard, as you sit here with Anshula and Rajan, and especially after you just heard that that, that speech with a flourish there from Rajan, you you're happy that you're part of a traditional business, so to speak, and not not the tech world. Well, that's the one thing. I think uh, the. You know, while tech world and traditional businesses may seem to be very different, I think the fundamental underlying premise yeah. of a value proposition of solving that consumer's problem still remains. So, so that way, yeah. traditional and you know, a new age businesses are the same. I think the point when you talk about valuation, it really gets down to, uh, for traditional businesses, it's about delivered performance. Yeah. It's, it's performance which people have experienced, and you know, you're you're kind of you have a brand value which has been created based on that. So this is performance, and in the case of the new age business, mm. it's about a promise mm. uh, of performance. Mm. Some of it which may have been realized, and some of which which may come in the future. Mm. So it's it's the you know it's the proof of the pudding already there to some yeah. extent, and yeah. there's a promise of a performance which is there in the future. And I think that's where you know there's a judgment which comes in. Mm. How much do you think this is worth in the future? And that's what really drives the valuations. Mm. But ultimately, the long-term destination is about that value creation, whether mm. it's a Google or a Snapchat or whatever it is. Mm. It's about creating value for the consumer, mm. which then drives the valuation. Mm. So that's how I would look so at it. So how have things changed for you, for instance, uh, in the last five years, as we live in an era where we've been driven more in India now with the idea of valuation? And of course, as you said, the marriage between promise, performance, and potential. Uh, how has that changed your mind in terms of strategy? I think the, the strategy is, again, the long-term you know, destination, though the definition of long term itself is, yes. you know, you can say, what is long term? Is it, it used to be so five what, years? What is, it, what is long term now for you, for instance, I, I, would say, I would say it is about two to three years, okay. and that's about it. That's, that's your long term. And there are a series of short term actions, but they all lead to a long term value creation. I think there are two, three things which have happened in the environment, which, which because of the, uh, the changes which have happened. I think one is because of digitization, there yeah. is this two-way conversation, right? We all know that. But two-way conversations is not just about brands and companies communicating to yeah. customers, but listening to what they have to mm. say mm. and responding in an agile manner. So yeah. I think the speed of how you respond mm. has certainly changed. Mm. But the speed with which you need to listen to mm. also needs to change, and that's not always the case. And that mm. is where the, a bit of a struggle comes mm. in. So I think that dynamic has created a situation where agility in terms of listening mm. has to be as as uh, I'd say ahead of the curve as agility in terms of response. Mm. I think the second thing which has happened is because there's so many choices available yeah. through you know, Google and otherwise, yeah. uh, you, you can kind of throw up a million options for, for just about anything. I think consumers' lives are becoming a little complicated and yeah. overloaded. Yeah. And not just because of Google, but because of how life is, you know, whether it's employment choices or choices for entertainment and mm. so on and so forth. Mm. And I think if, as brands, if we can simplify that, the whole life and a, and a solution, a mm. simple solution for the consumer, mm. I think that's where uh, the, the joy comes in. So, you know, we spoke about Uber and, and, and companies like that, and you're really providing a, a simplification of Absolutely. consumer's life. Yeah. Or you, lo you talk about even things like, uh, 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 let's say, your, uh, the Swiggy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's a lot of choice there, but it's, 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 you've simplified okay, no. it for, for consumers. So there's aggregation of disaggregated yes. businesses, formalization yes. of informal businesses as well as just making, yes. Whichever way taking you look away at the it, pain points yeah. from a consumer's it's, perspective. It's about simplification. So yeah. in our own business, we have, we have a very small spices business which is not even one year old. And I think the way we have provided simplification for the consumer is by giving them uh, the convenience of, let's say, five individual sachets in a 100 gram pack because mm. then she doesn't need to take tear the pack and tie it with a rubber band. Yeah. You know? So it's, it's a very small, simple thing. But it's, it's simplifying that life for the consumer. So I think these two things uh, are, are, are things which are driving how you engage with 
with consumers. So speaking of engagement, Sanjay, and let me put that point to you as well as uh, uh, listening to consumers and, and appropriating what consumers are telling you from a value creation perspective. Sure. I mean, you know, the dairy business is a, is a new business as far as ITC is concerned. Yes. Uh, you, you obviously don't want to end up in another commoditized space because that space is already captured, so you're not the first mover. You don't have the first mover yeah. advantage. Yeah. In that context, then, how do you think about valuation as well as value creation? Uh, well, coming from where Richa was talking about, it's more about value creation because I guess the fact is that for FMCG, value, uh, valuation models are there. So there are enough models available. But I think uh, you're absolutely right because we must be the number 200th company to think of entering dairy. Yeah. And what is really uh, in our mind is that how do we create value for the consumer yeah. in a differentiated manner uh, which is actually profitable. Mm. So it basically starts from understanding where the market is going. Mm. And uh, some of the products we put in, which are very small right now, are basically differentiated so that you actually deliver value mm. and you're able to give a product which the consumer may not have seen. Mm. The fact so is that... So when you say that you're putting uh, products in the market that the market doesn't necessarily have or you're listening to a need of a consumer that hasn't necessarily been met, is the way of identifying that different from what it used to be a few years ago? Just the point that Richard was making, for instance? Yes, it is because consumers are becoming more relevant. The fact is, if I look at foods, for example, the larger space, consumers today are reading back of packs more than they were, mm. let's mm. say, two years back. Mm. Uh, people are becoming more health conscious, more ingredient conscious. And that is something which uh, a lot of companies are doing, like uh, Richard talked about the fact that uh, you need to give consumers convenience. You also give to, you need to give consumers information because mm. the consumer is seeking information. And either you become the leader in that or you're left behind in the mm. entire thing. Okay. So, so those are the changes that you've made. David, let me get you to weigh in on what you've heard from the panel so far. Well, I mean, I found it very interesting. I mean, obviously, you know, coming from uh, WPP, where well, all of our 200,000 people every single day spend all of their time creating, developing, maintaining, and growing brands. You know, I suppose I take a relatively hard line because brands are really, really curious things. You know, you, don't, you can't touch them, you can't look at them. The only place they exist is actually, you know, in the minds of consumers. Mm. And unless the consumer has a very deep uh, emotional relationship with that brand, unless that brand fulfills an amazing need, then you don't have a, you don't have a brand. Mm. You might have a company, mm. you might have a fantastic business yeah. model, yeah. you might have users, but you absolutely don't uh, have a brand. David, Priya, Renuka, Sanjay, Richa, Rajan and Anshula, thanks very much for joining us here on the WPP CBC TV 18 CEO Roundtable for this year.